So I was listening to Joel Osteen, um, when was it, Friday? I was going to Joburg, and uh, <laughs> he said, uh, God made Adam, and Adam was alone. And then God visited Adam and saw he was alone. And he said, Adam, I can give you a companion. I can make you a wife. She's going to do everything for you and wash the dishes, make food for you every day, never argue with you, always agree with you in everything. <laughs> will always be there for you in all situations. And Adam says, yes, that sounds good. So Adam asks God, so how much would it cost? He says, an arm and a leg. And Adam says, how much can I get for a rib? Uh, I enjoyed that one. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Ah, hallelujah. Ooh, I love my wife. Maybe I, I should have offered the arm and the leg. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 1 verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to speak this over you this morning. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That is God's heart's desire for you is to be at peace, to live in peace and to live in rest. You know, Jesus paid the price so that we can operate out of a place of rest in this life. If we look at this world, we see people that has no idea what peace means. They have no idea what rest means. <laughs> they can never have peace because the troubles and the cares of this world is too much in order to sustain peace in their lives. But for us, hey, you are called to be a ruler of peace. You are called to be a maker of peace because that is God's heart for you. Grace and peace be to you. Blessed be God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Oh, hallelujah. All right, just stop there. It says, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all tribulation. That means you are being comforted in tribulation so that you can just get by and be happy. No, so that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. I want you to see the picture of God. God blesses you so that you can be a blessing. We're talking about the kingdom. I'm a kingdom person. I don't believe in one day we're gonna get raptured. I don't believe in one day you're gonna die and go to heaven and everything is gonna be honky dory. I believe that Jesus paid the price so that he brought heaven down to us so that we can live, rule and reign on this earth right now, right here. When COVID and everything comes, <laughs> we will not be governed by these things that the world puts on us because we are of a different kingdom. We are of the kingdom of God. So when the, God says that he is the God of all comfort, and He comforts us in all tribulation. That means we must then also be a comfort to others in trouble. See, that is the beauty of it. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the suffering of Christ abound in us, also our consolation also abounds by Christ. And whether be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you also be of the consolation. So we are not called to suffer for Jesus. Even though we do go through things, yes, that is not for us, because he paid the price. He went through the suffering so that we can be in freedom today. I want you to understand that God has a plan for you. He has a promise for you. <laughs> he has a reroad prepared for you. What is the plans that God has for you? Plans to? Come on, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. God does not want harm to be caused to you. That is not part of his plan. That is not part of his promise. That is not part of his word that is spoken over you. Come on, we're just going back to the offering. The word that God speaks cannot fall to the ground. So when he speaks it, even if you don't see it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But many times we find our ourselves in a place where 
We know what the Word of God is, but we don't see it now. And just because we don't see it now, we lose hope. And we ask God, why? <laughs> what if? I want you to take the word, what if? And uh, I know Windows users also has this thing called a uh, trash, trash bin. You take a file and you throw it in the trash bin. You don't leave it there. You go right click on the trash bin and you say empty trash bin. Because as long as it is in the trash bin, you can take it out again. <laughs> See, this is what we do with our lives, is we take things that's not supposed to be ours. We throw it in the trash. And then we find ourselves in a difficult situation and we go back to the trash bin and we take it out again. And we say, what if? Why? <laughs> Yo, I don't know how many of you has heard that sermon of uh, Bill Johnson. I think the title is Breaking the Bread of My Soul. And it's right after his, his wife has passed. And he said something quite amazing. He says, It is the backslider in heart that will judge God by what he didn't do. But those who run with tenderness for who he is will always define him by what he said, what he has promised, and what he has done. Now, when I heard that, I realized, wow. <laughs> we as humans, when something goes wrong, in our, I, I encourage you to go listen to that message. It is really, it, it, it felt deep. Because when we fall in a, a difficult situation, or when we experience hurt, the first thing we tend to drift towards is why God? Why me? Why this? And we take the promises of God and we don't receive it. Because God cannot operate in a why environment. God doesn't operate with options. <laughs> There's no A or B with God. Hallelujah, we're going to get this just now. So we are still in 2 Corinthians 1. Now let's pick up in verse 15. It says, In this confidence I was in minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit and to pass by you into Macedonia and come again into Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way to Judea, when I therefore was thus minded that I use lightness, or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me they should be a yea, yea, and a nay, nay. <laughs> but as God is true, our, words to, our word towards you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached amongst you by us, even the same me, Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay. But in him was yea, hallelujah, King James. Uh, I'm going to change my nose to nay. <laughs> and my yes is to yea. <laughs> I don't think Seth is going to understand me. <laughs> All right, verse 20, it says, do you have your Bible with you? Read it with me. For all the promises, I, I'm not hearing anyone. Do you have Bibles with you? All right, let me hear you. One, two, three. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him unto the glory of God by us. All the promises of God in him are yes, and they are in him. Amen. Ah, all right. So we want the promises of God, but the promises are only yes in him. And there are only amen in him. If you say why, you are taking the promises outside of God and trying to fulfill it. <laughs> because God didn't give his promises to you with a roadmap and a, a checklist. We like checklists, right? Wake up, brush your teeth, eat some yogurt with muesli. 
read five chapters of the Bible, pray 20 hours, and then you are ready for the day. Otherwise, God cannot speak to you. <laughs> oh, well, that's the old days already gone then. No, it says the promises of God in him are yes and they are amen and the glory of God by us. Now he which established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. Ah, oh. He has given us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts and he has sealed us with what? With what did he seal us? With the Holy Spirit, with His Word, with His promises. <laughs> ah, hallelujah. So, bear in mind, all the promises of God in Him are yes, and they are amen. I want to reassure you today that the promises of your life, they are yes, and they are amen. If you don't see them now, please go to your recycle bin, right click, and say empty trash can. Because most of the time, we always go back to, why? How long? What do I need to do? God does not work in those questions. <laughs> now you know what's the inter interesting thing about this? The promises of God, they are yes. Come on, preach with me. That's the perfect place where you can say amen. amen. <laughs> and they are amen. So if you do a bit of research, you'll find that within the 66 books of the Bible, there are approximately, who can guess the number? If we had a million dollar game show now, I would hear a bunch of numbers popping up. 8,810 promises. My goodness, I did not know that until yesterday. You're waiting for one thing from God, and God is saying, Here's a, a, here's a book of 8,000 promises for you, and they are yes, and they are amen. Look as you're getting it. There is so much more <laughs> in store for you than what you have tasted up until now, but why do we settle for so less? We need to understand that yeah, if we say God is good, we have no idea how good He is. You don't even know of the promises that's in the book. Mm. All right, all right. Hallelujah. 8,810 promises. Man, you're going to do some homework. I want to find all those promises next week. All right, I want an essay from every one of you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm, I'm just kidding, but it's good to go into it. Now let's go to James 1. James, a servant of God of Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren and sisters and children, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that this is a trying of your faith and it worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with a wind and tossed. For let no man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Verse 7. Let no man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. What is that man? That man that doubts. That man that wavers. That man that gets to the point and say why. Because doubt produces the word why. It originates from doubt. Is why. He shall not receive anything of the Lord. All right, I, I can't say this in a more stronger way. If you say why, don't think that you'll ask, receive anything of God. Hmm. 
Jo, pas tu var. Tas mums nav ārtāji. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Jo, just taking back to Peter on the water. Jesus commands Peter. He gives him his faith to walk on. The first thing Peter does is he looks at the waves. What you look at will become your reality. The circumstances that you are looking at will become your reality. And you will start doubting. Jesus tells Peter, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? The moment he doubted, he started to sink. That is beautiful. God gives you an opportunity to repent because he started to sink. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. So a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now let's jump to verse 17. Oh, let's, let's carry on reading. Yeah. <laughs> verse 9. Let the brother of low degree rejoice that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the glass, the grass, he pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grass of the fashion yoff. King James. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the flower they all falleth. And the grace of the fashion it perisheth. So shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord had promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he is driven away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it makes a baby called death. All right. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Woo! Every good gift. You know what a good gift is? It's a gift that is good, obviously, because it's a good gift. And every perfect gift is from the Father above. <sighs> and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, and neither shadow of turning. Now, all the promises of God, they are yes and they are amen. He doesn't work with a maybe. He doesn't work with a why. He works with an yes. If he said something, he will do it. Because every good gift and every perfect gift is from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Let's just jump back a few verses earlier. It says, do not let that man think that you will receive anything of God. The one that waves, wavereth, the one that doubts, because God does not have doubt in him. There is no variableness in God. You know what variableness means? It's the ability to change. There can be no change in God. There can be no changing his mind. But we as humans, ah, we just say, ah, Hester, you missed it yesterday. You kicked the dog. So no, let's just take these promises and remove it from your life. Penalize you on that. God is looking at us. Even if we missed it, even if we are unfaithful, he says, my word over you is true. My word over you will not fail. Even if you are unfaithful, I will remain faithful because that is his word. There is no variableness in him. Now this makes me think of what Bill said. The backsliding heart will judge God according to what he did not do. So there is no variableness in him. And there is no shadow of turning. The shadow of turning means, uh, when I started looking into it, it's sort of the celestial bodies, the sun moves and it causes shadow. It suggests that there is movement. If you have light shining on you from different angles, your shadow will show that you are moving. If you are walking, my shadow is moving. But God does not have a shadow. That means even in his past, he's still the same. 
is yesterday, today, and forever, he remains the same. There is no shadow of turning in him. My goodness, if his word worked for Elijah, his word is going to work for you, Eric. <laughs> if his promises in the Psalms are there and they work for David, Daniel, they're going to work for you today. What are the promises of God? Man, I have a couple that I really like. In Jeremiah 29, 11, you know what it says. I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you. Isaiah 60, ah, verse 1, Arise and shine, for your light has come. It says, Every good and perfect gift is from the Father of lights. Now he says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. It means the Father is with you. The gifts is with you. The promises are they. They are yes and they are amen. In God. <laughs> so, you cannot be in God and say why. You cannot be in God and say what if. God does not understand that. It doesn't work in that because there is no variableness. No variableness, I have a way that it, it, it ex explained to me um, when I started shooting with better cameras, uh, it came out with a, a variable frame rate, so it means you can bend the time so that you can have slow video and fast video is a variable frame rate. God, there is no variableness. You cannot go slow or fast, you cannot go Yes or no, there is only one thing. It is yes and amen. There is no maybe in God. I want you to remove the word maybe, why, why if, if not. Remove them from your mind because that is our stumbling block. The moment we start asking why, we step outside of the promises and we look at the promises and say, God, when? But you said, and then God said, but you also said, <laughs> why? <laughs> Remember the, the widow? She said, this is all I have. And then the word of God again told her, but if you do this, it will not run dry. She had to remove the, the idea of what is going to happen tomorrow. She had to sacrifice the, the assurance of knowing that she is going to die tomorrow because this is a lost resources. You know, it's difficult to sacrifice the, the hold on reality that we have by trusting God fully. And trusting God fully, it means surrendering my reason, my ability to understand how things work. It's a different place of operating. Oh, hallelujah. All right, we're still busy with the promises. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Verse 11, therefore, your gate shall be opened continually, that men may bring unto you the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings might be brought. Oof. Psalms 37, delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give you your heart's desires. Psalms 91. Man, the old Psalms of 91. There is no pestilence that will come into your camp. He who abides in the shadow of the Almighty shall hide under his wings. <laughs> See, this whole book is full of promises. But our why removes us from that place. See, the plan that God has for you is similar to you getting in your car and driving from here to Durban. Hallelujah, because Durban is warm and it's cold here. So you can think about Durban now. Have you been in Durban? Have you been in Cape Town? All right, so you have this idea of where your destination is. Now, driving from here to Cape Town is a long distance, correct? You just climb in your car and you drive. Nothing happens and you just arrive there and everything is well. No, we are in South Africa, guys. Come on. 
there's a 99.9% .9 chance you're going to hit a pothole. <laughs> but this is our life. We have a plan. There is a promise. On our way there, we might miss it. Something might come up in the road that we did not expect. That will cause us to stop in the process. The destination doesn't change. Durban doesn't magically stand up and go to another place. You don't have to recalculate the route. Durban is going to be exactly where you left him last time. And when you get there, everything will be the same. But you are on the way there, and things might happen. You see, the promises of God cannot change position. They cannot change in a timeline. Promises of God, they are yes, and they are amen. The word of God is yes, and they are amen. Sometimes we hit a pothole. Hey, just because Peter doubted that God rejected him, yeah, thank you, Peter. Hallelujah. Man, I don't know about you, but if you get called Satan, not by your fellow brother, but by Jesus himself, that's enough to make you just, all right, <laughs> I've missed it. I've not missed it small. I've missed it big. You know, we, sometimes we miss it small and it's easy to get over that. But if you get called Satan by <laughs> Jesus himself, then you know you've missed it big time. He stepped out onto the water, even stepping onto the word of Jesus himself, using the faith. I mean, we spoke about faith the other day. Even having the faith of Jesus, he still looked around and missed it and started to doubt. Jesus picked him up. Why? Because later down the line, he was supposed to be a blessing to so many other people. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. <laughs> There's going to come a time where you're not going to hit bottles anymore. There's going to come a time where the trials and the tribulations, you don't even need comforting anymore. That's why he says in James, count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials and temptations because it works the perfecting of your faith. When your faith is perfected, that means as you drive, the potholes in front of you get filled automatically because you are on your way to your destination. We lose heart so easily when things don't work according to how we think it should work. Things are never going to work out how you think it should work out. Come on, just wake up. How long are you alive? <laughs> or is it just me? <laughs> Am I talking for myself here? Things never work out how I plan it, but they always work out. And like that woman with the last resources giving Elijah bread, it's like, ah. Giving the last that she has, and then she has more than what she needs. How many times have you been in a position where you had nothing left? You have 10 rand and today that's not even enough to buy bread. Have you been in that situation? I've been there. I've been where I had no petrol left. I've been where <laughs> I didn't even have money left and yet the bank still phoned me to take more money from me. I've been there. But I've got through it. I realize that those situations doesn't define me or the Word of God over my life. Amen. You're still alive, even though you did not buy that bread. So, we, ah, we don't have hope in this life alone. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your word. Sometime, all the time, most of the time, 
the promises needs a word of activation from our part. Just using the example of a car and getting to Durban, a destination, there's an action that you have to take. You have to get in the car and drive. I want to take you back to the story of 1 Kings. You see, Elijah, God had a plan for Elijah to be used in order to supply a widow. But in order for that to happen, in order for the promises to be fulfilled, he had to speak the word first. He said, according to my word, and the very next sentence says, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So how many times are we waiting for the word of God and God is waiting for you to speak his word? We've heard it too many times in this house by the power of your words. My word in your mouth is as good as my word in my mouth. There is power in speaking. So we know we read the promises. We know where we need to get. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you your heart's desires. All these promises that are given to us, they are there. They are yes and they are amen. But your word activates the word of God to give you the journey. If you don't say anything, you're not going to have anything. God is almighty, right? Do you agree with me on that? He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is our King. He is our everything. So why couldn't He save the Israelites themselves out of the hand of Pharaoh? Because He needed a man to speak the word and release the word of God. So in your life, the situations, God can change your situations. He has all the power. But His word is activated through you. As you speak it, you start seeing it. As you release it, he starts giving it. So that's the beautiful thing. Thank you, Jesus. You're receiving something this morning. So working to receive the promises will result in a life with no peace. We do not do to get, we believe to receive. We do not work for the promises. Because working will remove your peace from you. Working in order to fulfill God's word will remove the peace from you. Because we just need to believe and receive. We need to speak and trust God. Now, I know it's easier said than done, (laughs) speaking, and then the next moment, everything kind of flips upside down. (laughs) Ha ha. Hallelujah. Like I said, nothing is ever going to work out according to how you think it should work out. But it's going to work out. And it's going to be better than what you think it should be. God just wants you to trust Him. Let's go to John 14. Yo, it's almost summer, guys. Hallelujah. (laughs) I like that love. Mm. I actually had a swim the other day, early morning. I was... uh, I wouldn't recommend it. John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believed in God, believe also in me. My Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and you... uh, you and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether you go. How can you say we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way 
the truth and the love, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known the Father also, and henceforth you've known him and have seen him. And Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you know me? You not know me, Philip. And he has seen me, I have seen the Father. And how says you then, show us the Father? Believe you that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, he shall also do, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Let's just go to James again. Every good and every perfect gift is from the Father of light. All the promises of God, they are yes and they are amen in Him. Now Jesus is in the Father. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. So we need to see the Father in order to receive the gifts that He has for us. The only way to see the Father is through Jesus. See, the world has all these ideas of who God is, but they don't recognize Jesus as the Son, as the doorway to the Father. So they are correct in all the powers and all the things that are available. They see it, but they cannot get it because it can only be accessed by Jesus. And if we are in Him, ah. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees Him not, neither knows Him, but you know Him, for He that dwells with you, and shall be in you, and I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while and the world sees me no more but you see me because I live you shall live also at the day you shall know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you and he that has my commandments and keep them uh, he it is that loves me and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him So Judah said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, is it that you will manifest yourself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings and the word which he hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things (laughs) to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Now verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. That is the promise that he made to you. Not, I'm going to send you my peace. He says, my peace I give to you. That means it's already been given. You need to receive it. You need to step into that place of peace. It says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Year after, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. But the world may know that I love the Father, and the Father gave me commandment. Even so, I do. Arise and let us go henceforth. And then chapter 15, he starts. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. 
Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, and no more can you, except you abide in me. Ah, the purpose of our lives is to bring forth fruit. And then we get pruned for the fun of it. No. To bring forth more fruit. Pruning is a painful process. But it is there so that you bring forth more fruit. It's going back to Elisha, sitting at the brook, having a jewel, having his lazy chair there. Ravens are coming, bringing food from across the country where there's still water. He's enjoying life. But there is no blessing flowing from him. He has fruit, but it's going to end off. Get up. Move on. Because there is someone waiting for your fruits. See, God will only bless you so that you must be a blessing. God doesn't just bless you and point. No. His kingdom works differently than just you. All right. I'll, I'll remove you out of the picture. His kingdom works differently than just me. Okay. No fingers pointed. If the blessing stops by me, then I'm not in the kingdom. If someone else's life is not blessed by my life, I'm not bearing fruit. Now, if the commandment over your life is to bear fruit, it means that you are not the one responsible for bearing fruit. You must just be the channel for the fruit to flow. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. And no more can you except you abide in me. Now this morning, ah, <laughs> the man that doubts or the man that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, tossed to and fro with all the questions of why. What, if, when, where, how long, how come, how far are we? <laughs> are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> no, are we there yet? <laughs> are we there yet? <laughs> I think God is hearing that are we there yet for 2,000 years already. It's like, come on. <laughs> You've been there all along. Just open your eyes. So a man that wavereth is like the wave. And do not let that man think that you receive anything of God. There is no difference between me, you, 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 you. There is no difference between us. There's no difference between us and my father, Corbus, when we saw did great things. Smith Wigglesworth, A. Allen. There's no difference between us because God has given us the same spirit. I think the only difference is they took the why and the if and they threw it in the trash and they emptied the recycle bin. See, most of us must still learn how to empty recycle bin. Because <laughs> it's easy to fall back into why if something is not working according to how I think it must. <laughs> oh. Yo, all right. So he says, my peace, I leave with you. Now, Philippians, is it Philippians 4, verse 7? It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. The peace of God that passes understanding. So, the peace that He gives to you doesn't work according to your understanding. 
It doesn't work according to your reasoning. But that peace that you cannot explain will keep your heart and your minds in Jesus Christ. Oh, Romans 12. I think we are almost getting done. Are you still awake? Ooh, Romans 12. Let's pick up from verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Hallelujah. Continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints and given to us fertility. Ooh, bless them <laughs> which persecute you. Bless and not curse. Can I repeat that? For all you holy saints in this house. <laughs> Bless them which persecute you. Bless them and not curse. Ah, mm. oh. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit and recompense to no man evil for evil. Hallelujah. <sighs> Sometimes... I get a flat wheel. I'm going to confess to you guys <laughs> that evil is being done to me. And guess what I do? I was like, oh, okay. So this is what you want to do to me. But this is the ammunition I have towards you. Because you want to judge me now and you want to take me to court and you want to get stuff out of me. But I've been staying cool and calm and collected. But now I'm tired of it. So now I'm gonna get you some of that. <laughs> yes. We do feel like that. And it is fine to feel like that. But do not entertain those thoughts. Do not let the words proceed out of your mouth. He says, get angry and sin not. What, what is sin? For us, being in Christ, sin is speaking a word over someone else that brings destruction. Because our nature is there to bless. Bless them that, <laughs> that persecute you. Bless them and curse not. Ah, Lord, why? <laughs> why would you say that? <laughs> Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Mm -mm. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. What is that turn the other cheek? Even though <laughs> they will speak evil and accuse you falsely, you just turn around and walk away. Why? Because he has given you his peace that passes understanding. The moment you recompense evil for evil, you, you are going to try and get his peace back by your understanding. And it's not going to be possible. I've learned this the hard way, guys. Huh. I have fought not the good fight of faith, but the fight of brethren. <laughs> Where accusations are made and I lay my accusations back. But this is you. I have done that. The end result is no one has peace. Even the other party, if they win and they get their money, guess what? There's no peace connected to what they have received. That money is going to be wasted, it's going to fade away, and they're going to be in a worse off situation. Because once you open the door to vengeance, ah, there's, <laughs> there are things that's going to creep through that door that you cannot stop. Why do you think the Bible says vengeance belongs to God? Because once you open a door, it means you allow things in and out of your life. Look, 
Aaron say, um, Vies slap gat, or let people just spit on you and walk over you. But you, you face them. But do not recompense evil for evil. You see, that's where the peace that passes understanding comes into play. Because even though they, they harm you, they hurt you, even if you are right, they'll cause damage to you. In that instance, you can still have peace. See, that is the difference. But why don't you start entertaining that battle? Your peace is... Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as his lies with you, live peaceably with all men. As long or as far as it is possible, live peaceably with all men. So, just to give you some, some freedom and clarity on that as well, if it is possible, <laughs> Sometimes you need to throw a punch. No, I'm joking. If it is possible, make sure that you operate out of peace and that as far as you can, the choices that you make will bring peace. Ooh. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 8, it says, You are more than an overcomer. By Jesus Christ. Revelations 21, it says, He that overcomes this world will inherit all things. I will be his God and he will be my son. So you are more than an overcomer. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Understand that you are blessed to be a blessing. You are blessed even to bless your enemies. Okay, that's not a thought we want to entertain, right? What does Jesus say in Matthew 5? It says, love, love them that love you. Doesn't the Republicans do the same? But I say, love your enemies and do good to them that persecute you. If someone takes you to law for your coat, give him your under jacket as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in that situation not too long ago where you want what from me? But we are called to a different life, guys. We are not called to operate as this world. We are called to operate in the kingdom of God. We are called to live the promises in the Word of God. We are called to be a blessing. We are called to have no variableness. We are called to have peace. So I hope everything comes together. As long as there's the questions of why, what if? How far are we? <laughs> are we there? As long as those questions come into our lives, doubt, is the origin of that. And where there is doubt, there can be no peace. So just trace it back to, he says, I give you peace. Not as the world gives. I give you peace that passes understanding. It means that if you do not understand the peace, don't try and remove the peace so that you can understand it. It's not going to work the way you think it should work. <laughs> but it's going to work. 
It's not going to operate in the way that you plan it, but it's going to operate. Does that mean we just do nothing? No. No, 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 no. It means you do everything. It means what you find to do, you do. Elijah, the word of God came to him after he spoke. Don't be sitting waiting for the word while you have it already in you. Start activating <laughs> the promises by speaking. Amen. Amen. That's what I want to bless you with this morning.